here in Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to read beginning at verse, just to conclude the uh, context of this passage. I'm going to begin reading again, as I have a couple of times recently. I'll begin reading at verse 10, but I'm going to conclude at verse 17. And our subject is found in verse 17. But beginning at verse 10, Ephesians chapter 6. Paul writes, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take in the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, as we've seen, as we've been going through the book of Ephesians and have arrived at this particular portion of Scripture, Paul has been instructing the Ephesians concerning spiritual warfare. And last time we were together, we looked at the uh, helmet of salvation. Now, I mentioned to you that believers are to be continually girded with truth. We are to wear that breastplate and we're to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Well, the following three weapons, as I've mentioned, are to be used in individual battles. The shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. Now, those weapons are kept in a state of readiness. So we raise or we take up these weapons when we are engaged in actual combat. We take up the shield by applying what we know about God, everything we know about God through the Bible. We put on the helmet by calling to mind the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. You see, one of the enemy's tactics is to encourage us to doubt and to encourage us to hopelessness. This, I think, is one of his most effective devices, undermining our confidence in Christ. And he also encourages us in our own sense of unworthiness, and that's an ancient tactic. What he desires us to feel is abandoned and sorrowful. The psalmist said in Psalm 27, 13, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I would have despaired unless I would have known or believed that I would actually be with the Lord. Psalm 43, 5, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? And then he self-talks, if you will. He says, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior, my God. And so the enemy tempts us to be abandoned, a sense of, a sense of sorrow that, that we're abandoned by God. And, and it, it's, a, it's a tactic he's used on, on many, including the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, Paul said it like this. He said, we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. We despaired. We were in that sense that we were going to die, but we trusted the Lord. So when under such attack, we remember to put on the helmet. We call to mind who we are in Christ, and we call to mind what God is doing. So the next weapon, the one that we're going to be looking at, is the sword of the Spirit, which he says is the word of God. Now, the sword that Paul refers to is is a a sword that the Roman soldier would carry. It was what we would call today a short sword. It was anywhere from dagger length, six inches, up to about 18 inches in length. It was carried in a sheath, and it was attached to a belt. And this is the kind of sword that was used for hand-to-hand combat. So he's informing us that God's word is actually our spiritual weapon. This weapon, the sword of the Spirit. Now, I'll develop this with you for just a moment. Notice how it's referred to as the sword of the Spirit. That means that this sword is not of human origin. It means that this sword, this weapon, is of divine origin. It's the sword of the Spirit. 
In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, Peter said it like this. He said, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So Peter had said that the Spirit led and inspired the writers of Scripture as they wrote. Now, Jesus taught us that the Holy Spirit is the teacher, the teacher of God's truth. In John 14, 26, he said, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. In John 16, 13, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. This is the sort of the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who inspires Scripture. It's the Holy Spirit who is the teacher of God's truth. So they communicated God's truth, these writers of Scripture, but they retained their own personalities. This, there's a phrase that, that theologians use, Bible teachers will use it in school and all. I heard professors use it. They said truth, truth uh, through personality. You can read your Bible and you're going to notice as you read it carefully that the writers had different styles. The Apostle John wrote with a different style than the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul wrote with a different style than the Apostle Peter. The Gospel of Mark is a different style than the Gospel of John. So you'll see that there are concepts and words that are used that are particular to each one of those writers. And yet they are all coalescing on the same truth. Because it's the Holy Spirit who inspired them to write the words and they wrote them as it pertained to their own personalities and understandings of the way God was, was moving them. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All Scripture given by inspiration of God. So and he says that all, speaking of biblical scripture, is inspired. It's theonustos. It's, it's God-breathed. All scripture is God-breathed. It's inspired by God. Now he points out that this God-breathed scripture prepares us for a life of service. And it's not only going to benefit Timothy, who is reading that at that time, but it benefits all who trust in the word of God. So all scripture is given by inspiration. All scripture as distinct from simply the Old Testament writings this would include his own letters. You see, during, the, during this time, the entire New Testament writings had yet to be collected. The recognition of the 27 New Testament books had yet to occur. So the official gathering and recognizing of what is called New Testament canon did not occur until the Council of Hippo. It was a lot of big guys. The Council of Hippo, which is in, in modern Algeria, in 393 A.D., and again, at the Council of Carthage in Tunisia in 397. So the recognition of the 27 books had yet to occur. Prior to those dates, the Old and New Testaments were recognized as inspired. They were even sometimes combined in Scripture. For example, 1 Timothy 5.18, uh, Paul said, The Scripture says, Do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. So when he said, do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain, that spoke of Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. But when he said, the worker deserves his wages, that was Luke chapter 10, verse 7. And so the scriptures were recognized both Old and New Testament as inspired. The apostles recognized their writings as inspired and even authoritative. In Colossians 4, 16, and I'm laying a foundation for you. In Colossians 4.16, it says, After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. So they recognized their writings as being inspired, and they would actually share each letter with other church churches. In 2 Peter 3.16, uh, he said, writing of Paul, Peter says, he writes the same way in all his letters, Speaking in them of these matters, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do, and then he went on to use this phrase, as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. So they were recognizing the writings of Paul as being scriptural and authoritative. 
In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, and we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it actually is the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. And so when Paul was using the word inspiration, that word as mentioned, theonustos, is literally God breathed. It owes its origin to the breath of God, an outpouring of life to man. Somebody once said, if we are left in doubt as to which part is inspired and which is not, we are as badly off as if we had no Bible at all. He went on to say, I hold no theory of inspiration. I accept the inspiration of scriptures as fact. So it's profitable, this word. The Bible was written to reveal God's ways to us. So what is it profitable for? The Bible is profitable for teaching. The word teaching speaks of provoking us to learn. It informs us of God's revelation in Jesus Christ. It's profitable for rebuking. The word rebuke speaks of correcting error, correcting error in understanding of Scripture and in the way that we live. It speaks of correction. That speaks of a restoration to a right relationship with God. And it speaks of training, because by yielding to it and practicing these things, it develops our spiritual understanding, and the result is the man of God is thoroughly furnished. He is thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, God's word is spoken of as being sufficient to equip us. In Psalm 119, verse 9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed unto thy word. In verse 11, thy word have I hidden in mine heart that I might not sin against you. So, I'll just take a moment to say as a Calvary pastor, it's my desire to teach the whole counsel of God. And that's because I want our fellowship to be thoroughly equipped for every good work of service. And that's what pastors are commanded to do. We are commanded to teach the word of God. We are to, to proclaim God's word as it is. We're to teach it in every way, shape, and form, and when given every opportunity or any opportunity, we are to teach his word. The Lord gave a promise in the book of Jeremiah. It's found in chapter 3, verse 15. And he said this. He said, I will give you shepherds according to my heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. I will give you shepherds according to my heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. I will give you shepherds, those who have responsibility to oversee your spiritual life. I will give you shepherds according to my heart. These are things that are outpourings of my love and expression to you expression of that love. And they're going to feed you. They're going to feed you with knowledge. That's not only the knowledge that is given through rightly dividing the word and presenting it, but it also speaks of a, a spiritual understanding through personal experience. So they're going to feed you with knowledge and understanding. They're going to give you wisdom through the word of God because they know the word of God and they're a gift to you. That's what God said to the nation of Israel in Jeremiah 3.15. When Paul was speaking to the Ephesian elders, he had an opportunity as he was on his way to Rome, he had an opportunity to meet with the group of elders who were coming from, uh, from Ephesus, the church that ultimately Timothy himself was pastoring. And when Paul was there in this place called Miletus, a port city there uh, on the coastline uh, of uh, Turkey, he had met with these elders, and as the elders came and met with him, he began to share with them, and he, he told them how he had he had uh, ministered to them, and he knew it was the last time he would see them. He had final instructions and final words to speak to them. And you would ask yourself a question. You would ask yourself, if you knew this was the last time that you were going to meet with some people, say you were a spiritual leader and you were overseeing, leading, building up, mentoring, developing people in the faith, what would you want to say? What kinds of things would you say to them if this was your last, last time that you speak to them? Eventually, there's going to be time. It's really not that far away compared to the time that we've already experienced here. You know, I've been pastoring this church for 41 years. I'm not going to be here for another 41 years. It's my prayer that the rapture is going to happen long before that. And nobody would want to hear a man who's 103 years old or 113 years old anyway. So, or maybe somebody would. We'll see. But I know that the time comes when the Lord is going to remove me and place somebody else. And I know that. 
But what would I want to share with the fellowship? What, what, what would I want to say if I had a last opportunity? That's what you see when you read the book of Acts chapter 20, especially when the Apostle Paul is ministering and speaking to these, these elders of the church there in Ephesus. And one of the things that he says is found in Acts 20 verse 27 when he says, I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. I've taken you from the A to the Z. I've taken you through it. I have prepared you. I've adequately taught you. He said, you saw my manner of life. He said, I've been with you in fears, trials, and, and the persecutions. You're aware of the various things that I've gone through. I've been an open book to you. I've shared with you everything that I could say to you. Every, I've done as much as I could in front of you to model those things. I've been in every way, shape, and form uh, very obviously aware of my, my, my relationship with you and my desire uh, to to build you up in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. They've given you the word of God, which is able to build you up. He says, but I have not shunned to declare unto you the entire counsel of God. I have told you from the A to the Z, I have built you up properly. And that's what every shepherd, that's what every minister is commanded to do. That's what we've been commanded to do. There are times, and I'll say this briefly, but there are times when, when we have opportunities to address current events, and I think we should. I think pastors ought to. Uh, share current events. And sometimes when you share concerning those current events, people can get upset. And people do get upset. That's just, I guess, the way it is. People get upset, and there's nothing you can do to, to avoid that. There are always people who, who have their opinions and all, and they get upset because you've said certain things. But every pastor has a responsibility to teach the right and true thing. And sometimes the things that we say may be hurtful to some, at least it, they may be pain, pained for a moment. And no pastor wants to beat the sheep. We want to feed the sheep. Yet, it's our responsibility to go out and, and to speak these things. That's why we go from the A to the Z. Because you see the blessings of God, but you also see in Scripture the times that he will buffet you. You see both. And that's what you'll see as you go through Scripture. And so as a Calvary pastor, for uh, the 41 years that I've pastored this church, and for the two years prior to that, and for the years prior to that, when I started teaching Bible studies at the age of 23 in 1973, the one thing I've tried to be is, is, is faithful to teach the Word of God. And so the time will come when people no longer endure healthy teaching, but uh, according to their own desires, they're going to heap unto themselves teachers because their ears are itching to hear other things. I understand that. I understand the days that we're living in. I understand the the uh, narcissism that many, many are now suffering with. It has to be my way or it's the highway. I, I get that. But at the bottom line, guys, if I don't as a pastor teach you the word of God, who's going to? My responsibility is to teach you. I'm, I'm laying this as a foundation. That's my responsibility, to diligently pursue the things of the Lord. I had somebody say, it must be nice and easy to be a pastor. You golf three, three days out of the week and you teach a couple of times. They don't understand ministry. They don't understand the hours it takes to prepare one Bible study. They don't understand it takes me two days for each study I do. It takes days of study and hours of preparation and cross-references and what does the scripture say and what does this commentator say? It's a lot of work, but it's worth it. Why? Because we're safeguarding the sheep from error. We're safeguarding. And sometimes there's criticism, and I understand it goes with the, the territory and all, but the things that sometimes kind of crack me up in a way, is somebody who's never even given a Bible study has a, a propensity to teach me how to teach. And I find that interesting. But that's today. That's the way people are. You know, what are you going to do? We just slap them in the face and move on. <laughs> but as we look at this, you know, we're to teach the A to the Z. We're to equip the, the sheep for works of service. And so this is what the sword does. So in battle, the sword is uh, both a defensive weapon as well as an offensive weapon. Everybody knows that. The sword is used not only to defend, but also to go on the offense. And so the word of God provides defense. It, it provides a defense against the attacks of the enemy. And we're under constant attack by various forces, forces that unite to oppose God. Uh, scripture informs us there are, there are at least three forces that we will constantly battle. Uh, we battle the world, we battle the flesh, and we battle the devil. You see, we're under attack by the world. The world is the system energized by Satan, 
in opposition to God. The world represents the culture that we live in, and that culture that we live in is evangelistic, and it's very persistent. Turn on the TV, listen to the, the radio, read a magazine. That world is constantly evangelizing you. This world system is revealed in language. It's revealed in, in our music, in the arts, in fashion, social mores, religious beliefs. These things make up the world. And these things are what make up what has been referred to as the culture wars. And the influence of the world is corrupting. The influence of the world ultimately does its best to steal your innocence. The world and its system intends to destroy. It's in constant opposition to the things of God. The Apostle John said in 1 John 2, 15 and 16, he said, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Jesus said in John 15, 19, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world thinks you're great. <laughs> therefore the world hates you. Some of you sometimes have experienced that. Every one of us who's a believer does. And one time or another, you do experience the hatred of the world. Um, and you might even be surprised. It might even hurt your feelings. You might even get so bummed out that you're not the most popular person anymore because you're a Christian. But that's just the way it is. See, Jesus said it. He said the world loves its own. If you do the same things, if you agree on the same things, if you go the same places, if you do all of that, yeah, they'll accept you. But when you say, you know, no, I don't do that anymore. I don't party anymore. Well, what happened to you? No, I don't act the fool anymore. What happened to you? You know, I don't get loaded. Any what happened to you? I'm going to be faithful to my wife. What happened to you? I mean, the world really does disagree with that. And, you know, and I don't want to go too far into this, but, you know, when you say that as a man, I say, I'm a man and I believe a man should marry a woman. What's wrong with you? You know, that my child does not have the ability at the age of four years old to determine whether that boy is really a girl. I heard just yesterday one professor who was saying that, that babies in the womb are already confused as to whether they're male or female. See, this is idiocy. That's a Greek word. <laughs> it comes from the Greek word, truly. It comes from the Greek word idiotes. <laughs> or the Spanish, idiota. But there, it's... <laughs> It comes from that. <laughs> it's the truth. It, it's an idiocy. It's imbecilic. It's moronic. It's anti-God. That's the world. See, that's the world. You, you see it, it. It's around you. It surrounds you. This cancel mentality. Don't say things we don't appreciate or agree with. And, and Christians, because we want to be meek and we want to be loving, you know, you can get confused sometimes. But guess what? Sometimes you just have to speak the truth. You speak it in love, but somebody's got to speak it. You know, and that's, it's like when Isaiah had a vision of the Lord in Isaiah 5, and he says, uh, uh, Isaiah 6, and he says, um, he's in, the, in, in the year the king Isaiah died, I saw the Lord. He was high and he was lifted up. The train filled the temple. And then he hears, you know, the, the, the angels singing, holy, 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 and all, and he's just amazed. He says, I'm a I'm a, a, I'm a, a man with an uh, evil tongue, he says, and I dwell amongst a people with uh, evil lips. And then the question came out, and it says, who will go for us? And then he says, here am I, Lord, send me. Well, there are a lot of people who know that passage, and when it gets to the point, who will go for us? Uh, they'll say, there he is, Lord, send him. But Isaiah said, here am I, Lord, send me. And, and, I, and I wonder... How many of us have been given opportunities to be like an Isaiah in a classroom or a neighborhood or a conversation in a store? But we were there saying, man, I just wish somebody else were here to take care of this for me. That's why we study the word of God. That's why we spend time. Listen, it, it isn't something that, that necessarily comes easy. There are those 
who I have to tell you, I, I admire, who have this incredible memory. They're able to read something one time, you know, and, and they remember it. I'm not that guy. I have to pour over and pour over and pour over things, you know, and, and it takes a lot of work for me to remember. And I'm at that point now that I can remember the words, but I don't remember the numbers. And that I require, okay, it was Isaiah, you saw it a minute ago, Isaiah, no, Isaiah 6. I have to do that. I hope that's a, an inspiration for you to realize you're, you can do it. It just takes a de devotion. It just, it just takes, a, I'm going to do this. Somebody needs to do this. And so we, we need to stay in the word. You see, if we were of the world, the world would get along with us. But because we actually stand in opposition to it, it hates us. We also battle our flesh because my flesh resists yielding to the spirit of God. My flesh yields to a system that's energized by Satan. And actually, Satan feeds that system. In Galatians 5.17, Paul said, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. There's a war that takes place. That's why in Matthew 26, 41, Jesus said, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but he said the flesh is weak. And so there's a battle going on. And then we're attacked by Satan and Satan opposes God and all who would obey God. Satan is in constant rebellion. There's not a time when he's not rebelling. And he encourages people to rebel also. In 1 John 5, 19, John said, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So these three forces unite in opposition to God and to his rule. As believers, we are under attack constantly. I wonder if anybody in this room had a tough time getting here tonight. Most of you say, no, I'm, nah, yes, you, some of you did. You should see if you stand there at the, at the uh, driveway and watch people come in on Sunday. <laughs> you can see their heads as they're arguing, and then they hit the holy highway here. Because <laughs> it can be tough. It can be tough sometimes because... Because the, the enemy doesn't want you to be in the word. He doesn't. Believe me, I'm not making this up. You know this. He doesn't want you in the word. He wants you to be like a toothless dog. You know, you think you're bad, but you got no teeth. Well, the word of God is your teeth. Put your teeth on. So... We have a means of defense that God has provided, his word. That, again, is the sword of the spirit. We don't hold tightly to the word of God. Many don't hunger for the word of God. And as a result, their minds are formed by the world. In Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, God simply said it like this. He said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Your reliance on God's word is actually revealing your relationship with God. Be very careful that you do not replace the word of God with man's philosophies and man's delusions. Be very careful. The enemy likes to add to the word of God. It wasn't that long ago, and it's still said, and I'll say it like this. I'll just say what used to be very popular. Perhaps it still is to some degree. I think it is. Where people said... In order to love others, I have to first and foremost love my God. I'm sorry, love myself. I first love me, and then I can love you. Uh, you've heard that. You have to love yourself. Uh, I hate to tell you, you already do. You, you, that's a problem, isn't it? No man has ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes and cherishes it, Paul said in chapter 5. You haven't hated it. See, it's like people say, I hate myself, I hate myself because I'm so ugly. I hate myself. No, no, that's not true. Because if you really hated yourself, you would be glad that you're ugly. <laughs> right? <laughs> Wouldn't you? I mean, that's true. I hate him. He's so ugly. And I'm glad he's ugly. Well, I hate myself because I'm ugly. No, no. You love yourself so much that you're disappointed 
that you don't think you're as good looking as you'd like to be. It's called narcissism. And so all we have is we, <laughs> where'd I, why am I telling you this? Well, I just want to, you know. But it's true. You see, nobody ever went out and looked at the stars and said, when I behold the stars, the works of your hands, how wonderful I am. No, it, 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 it makes you say, what is man? That you are mindful of him, the son of man, that you should consider him. It humbles you. It doesn't exalt you. When you know that God flung the stars with his fingers and knows every constellation by name, every star, that humbles you. It doesn't exalt you, see? And so what happens is this crept into, that's just one of the things that crept into the church in, in, the, uh, in the 70s and 80s, especially 80s and early 90s. That was something we dealt with. Well, they say, didn't Jesus say, you're to love your neighbor as yourself? Well, you love yourself, don't you? So you should love yourself, then you love your neighbor. And they say, well, joy, Jesus, others, yourself. No, that's wrong. It should be yourself, others, and Jesus. I heard that, and I spoke against that. And I said, that's not what Scripture says. Because they, the, the, the man walks up to Christ and says, Master, what is the great commandment in the, law, in the law? And Jesus said, there are two. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, with all your mind. And a second, he said, is like unto the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. He didn't say, and the, oh, by the way, there's a second, and then I didn't mention, and the third, love yourself. And so what they did is they took two commands, made them into three, and that found its way into the church, and narcissism, it's got to be my way or the highway, came into the church because we stopped being servants, and it had to have it my way. This isn't Burger King. It has to be done my way. No, it has to be done his way. And the way that comes is through his word. And see, it's very practical. It's very basic. You know, we, we must not replace God's word with man's delusions and philosophy. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. Every word of God is flawless. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. God's word can be trusted from Genesis to Revelation. And we hold tightly to his word. And in doing so, it keeps us from Satan's deceptive snares. In Colossians 2, 8 through 10, Paul said it like this. He said, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. So God's word is a defensive, but it is also an offensive weapon. We wield that weapon when we proclaim his word to those who have yet to hear the message. We also are wielding it when we speak to those who have heard but still reject. In Hebrews 4.12, it says the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Now, when it speaks concerning the word of God, uh, being the spirit, sword of the spirit, that word, word, in verse 17 is a Greek word you've, you've probably heard before. It's rema. Rema has been defined as a word that is what is called a particular word, an individual statement. It's speaking of how the, the sword is to be wielded skillfully and precisely. You're not just swinging it around, in other words. There's precision to it. So when the enemy is attacking, you deflect the attacks of the enemy, then you inflict harm on his purposes. When we proclaim the word of God, it's an offensive weapon. I think it was Charles Spurgeon who simply said it like this. He said, the word of God is like a lion. Just let the lion out of the cage. And that's the preaching of the word. Let the lion out of the cage. God has a way of doing what he wants to do. You see, when you proclaim the word, you use it in an offensive way. When we, when we wield it evangelistically, we are actually freeing captives from the grip of the enemy. In Luke 4, 18 and 19, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, 
to set at liberty those who are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He has sent me to preach to the poor and to heal the brokenhearted. Whenever somebody goes through pain, they don't want to hear your philosophy. They don't want to hear your opinion or your ideas. If they're a believer, and even when they're not a believer, if you're wise and know how to wield the sword, you give them the word of God. Because it's the word of God that can penetrate even the most broken heart and heal it. I wonder how many in this room have been healed of a broken heart. I have. I've had a broken heart. And God healed it by his word. That's what he does. He heals with his word. And when you preach the word of God, sharing the gospel with people, you're giving them the opportunity to have a broken heart healed, to have their eyes restored to see what is real, not what is phony. The word of God is very important. You see, when Satan brings doubt, he asks the question, did God say? And so the way we respond with the sword is we say, it is written. Did God say? It is written. Did God say? It is written. And if you don't know what is written yet, then you seek the Lord. You may go to somebody who's been in the word longer than you, share with them, and they can give you the scriptures that go home and, and, it, it, and it heals your heart. So when God is working in our, our lives, he does it through the word, and that's why we remain teaching the word of God. Now, I was putting this together. I, I, I wrote a few things that I want to give to you as I'm about to conclude this installment of our study. There are many benefits that you receive from God's word. In God's word, there is life. In John 6, 63, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. In God's word, there is freedom. John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. In God's word, there is purity. Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. In God's word, there is light in the midst of spiritual darkness. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. His word increases faith. John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps him, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. And I love this part of it. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. There have been times, I bet in your life, been, there have been times in mine when I'm obeying the Lord. Perhaps he's placed it on my heart, we'll say, to share with somebody something. And as I'm sharing with them on a personal level, just sharing with them, I can sense the, the presence of God in a way that is kind of unusual and even very, very much very real. And then I think of this particular verse here that I just quoted, because Jesus said, I will love him and will manifest, I will make myself known. And in obedience, and this is really an important thing, I probably could spend a long, long time on this, I won't, but I could. It's in the obedience that you begin to learn the deeper things of God. There's the theoretical knowledge you can have just by, you know, putting notes in your Bible. But there's the experiential knowledge you have when you put that into practice and God shows up. And you go and you talk to someone, you say, I can't believe what God did today in my life. Sometimes they'll look at you as if you're kind of crazy. And, and maybe you'll think you are too. Maybe you will. But, you know, everybody's somebody's fool. I just as soon be a fool for God than for the world anyway. So you, you do what the Lord says. He shows up. And I don't know why I get surprised, but I do. It's like, wow, wow. So oh, thank you, Lord. That was so cool how you showed up. And he says, yeah, I did, I, I'm keeping my word. So he increases our faith. Put it into practice. His word heals our soul. Again, it brings refreshment to a broken heart. Psalm 19, 7 says it like this. The law of the Lord is perfect. The law of the Lord lacks nothing. It says restoring or reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. It's reliable. Making wise the simple. Making wise the open-minded. 
The law of the Lord restores, revives, it refreshes our soul. He heals us through his word. His word gives us victory. In 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. He seeks whom he may devour. When he says resist him, firm in your faith, it's not simply the faith that we have, but it's speaking of that which uh, composes our faith, being strong in what you know about God in his word. It's that kind of faith he's speaking about. Resist him through the word of God. And so I'll close with a couple of things. How can we be prepared to do this? Basic things. One, read the word regularly. Read it regularly. If you can't read that well, and I had a fellow in the church who approached me once and said, Pastor, you, you say we should read the word, but I have to be honest with you. And he, he was a, a successful businessman, but he said to me, I can't read. He says, I, I, I never learned to. And I discovered that he's not alone in that, that there are many others who have difficulty reading. Some people have reading uh, problems, dyslexia and various other things like that. And I've seen that. So I said to him, you know what? Listen to, listen to the word of God. If you can humble yourself to do this, ask your wife and hold the Bible, and hold the Bible with you because he could learn to read. I said, but have her read to you, but get the word into your soul. That's the whole point I'm making. Listen to the Bible. Uh, if you have a Bible app or something, read something that you can read. If you can read it uh, easily, read that, but read regularly. Be in the word regularly. Also read carefully. That's simply, I mean, just concentrate on words and meanings. Don't speed read the Bible, but take your time in reading it. Read systematically. Don't jump around just playing Bible roulette. What am I going to read today? You know, and you put your finger down on a verse. Um, wow, Judas went out and hanged himself. That's, <laughs> that's not for me. So you turn. And then you put your finger down again. Go out and do the same. No, I don't, I don't want to receive like that, you know. Read systematically, then read obediently. Determine that what you read, you will, in Christ, you will do. Again, that's how you grow. And then finally, read patiently. You don't go out into your backyard and plant a tree and the next day harvest fruit. You take care of it, you water it, you give it time. It grows through its seasons, eventually producing be patient. Don't beat yourself up because you have to read something several times or don't understand it. Don't beat yourself up. Just keep seeking the Lord. Be humble enough to ask questions and watch what the Lord will do. And finally, I read this somewhere and I just I wrote it down so I could read it to you as we close this section. Somebody wrote, the Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy. Its precepts are binding. Its histories are true. And its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be safe. And practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is a traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's character. Here, paradise is restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand object, our good is its design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It has given you in life and will be opened in judgment and will be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, will reward the greatest labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. The sword of the Spirit. Father, we